underwater archaeology in Turkey began in 1958 and 1959. When New York photojournalist Peter Throckmorton lived on this Turkish sponge boat, Mandalinci, asking its captain, Kemal Aras, to show him any ancient shipwrecks he had seen on the seabed. One of more than a dozen Kemal told him about lay almost 100 feet deep near Cape Caledonia on the western side of the Bay of Antalya on Turkey's southern coast. Peter went there in 1959 and saw the wreck lying between two or five islands just off the end of the Cape. He recognized that it was over 3,000 years old, the oldest shipwreck ever found dating from the Bronze Age. He convinced the University of Pennsylvania Museum to sponsor an expedition to see if it was possible to excavate an ancient wreck underwater as carefully as ancient tombs and buildings are excavated on land. So, in 1960, after establishing a camp on a narrow strip of beach where we found fresh water and would live for the next three months, graduate archaeology student George Bass, Peter Throckmorton and myself began the excavation of the wreck with an international team from the United States, France, Turkey, England and Germany. Anne Bass arrived, surprised to see where she would spend her honeymoon with George. Each day we sailed out an hour from camp to where the ship sank, eight of us diving from an old sponge dragger moored over the site. Mapping the site was as important as mapping any archaeological site on land, for this was the first ancient shipwreck ever excavated in its entirety on the seabed. Sometimes we removed sediment with a large suction hose known as an airlift, and sometimes we chiseled free from the seabed large masses of metal cargo, concreted together, which we raised to the surface with air-filled lifting bags. Our methods may have been crude, but our results were of great historical importance. The ton of cargo we found wasn't attractive, a lot of scrap bronze, mostly broken agricultural tools from the island of Cyprus, and ingots of copper and tin. But the wreck rewrote the history of Bronze Age trade, for it showed Phoenicians sailing these waters centuries earlier than historians had believed. Now, Captain Kemal, assisted by his fellow divers, prepares to dive 120 feet deep off Yarsiada, or Flat Island, on the southwest Turkish coast. The treacherous reef running out from the island has sunk a dozen ships over the centuries, the last being a modern freighter that ran aground there in 1993. But it is sponges Kemal is after. His livelihood depends on them. The aged compressor sends air down through the hose paid out to fathom at a time by his tender. Lowered gently from above, Captain Kemal soon reaches the seabed, where he begins his quest for sponges. As he searches the rocky bottom, he is almost neutrally buoyant, so his lead shoes do not crush the cargo of 1,300-year-old jars across which he strolls. He has no interest in Byzantine amphoras. He knows that they are old, but illegally selling for no more than $5 a piece in Turkey, they are not worth the hassle to be encountered from local customs, police, or the Coast Guard. His sponge bag is full. He signals that he is going to surface. Assisted by his diving companions, Kemal surfaces at Mandalinci's diving ladder, climbs aboard, and hands his bag of sponges to waiting crew. Picking sponges is only the first step. As some of his crew remove Kemal's helmet, others on board begin to prepare the sponges for market, either threading them so they can be hung out to dry, or crushing them between their feet in order to remove the living black membranes that cover them. Diving now over, Mandalinci begins the two-hour sail back to its home port of Bodu. Today, tourists arrive in jumbo jets at the modern international airport outside Bodrum, and the population swells to a quarter million in summer. 
There are traffic jams, and at night, the noise of a thousand bars and the world's second largest discotheque. But back in 1961, Bodrum was an isolated, sleepy town of 5,000 people. It's only automobile, an old jeep taxi. A diesel generator supplied the electricity for two hours a day, and drinking water came from a distant spring. In 1961, George Bass, Anne Bass and I, veterans of the Cape Galadonia excavation, were back in Turkey with Turkish photographer Mustafa Kapke, there to excavate the Byzantine ship Kemal found at Yasiada. Mustafa had shown us the wreck at the end of the 1960 Cape Galadonia excavation, and except for Peter, now working in Greece, we are all back in Bodrum. Herb Greer is once again an expedition photographer, but physician Charles Fries is a newcomer. Along with Kemal and his mate of many years, we are soon joined by the rest of the team, including Swarthmore undergraduate Susan Woomer and diving instructor Larry Jolene. Like this lady on what is today a four-lane highway, we are in town for market day. The Bodrum economy was modest, based on agriculture. There were no supermarkets in those days, but plenty of fresh produce. Anne and a young assistant, Dursun, make their way through the crowd looking for tomatoes or fresh cucumbers at just pennies a kilo. Anne has been up since 4.30 to buy fresh bread for a 5.30 breakfast. But food was not the only thing found in the market. Joined by our cook, Anne continues shopping. On their way home, they pass marble reminders that Bodrum was once the ancient city of Halicarnassos, birthplace of Herodotus, the father of history. With another veteran of the Cape Caledonia excavation, art professor Eric Ryan, we stop with the luxury of a shave on what was, and still is, the main tourist street of Bogu. We run into an old sponge diver and head off to learn about more wrecks. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Every Friday, the team heads for the Hammam, the Turkish bath, to rid themselves of salt, grime and exhaust fumes. Herb Greer shampoos, while architect Bill Wiener enjoys working up a good lather in the heated steam room. The Bodrum Harbor now contains an enormous marina, a transient home for magnificent yachts from around the world. In 1961, there were no tourist boats, only boats for fishing and sponging. We depart at 6, for a two-hour sail aboard Sarane, a fast, sloop-rigged motor sailor. Today the sea is calm. On most days, we sail head-on into gale-force wind of the seasonal Meltem, which keeps even large steel freighters in port. Once out of the harbor, with the sail hoisted, we head up the coast. The team, with few hours sleep, grabs this opportunity to rest, relax, and perhaps catch up on some reading. Fred Van Dernick discusses the wreck plans with George. 45 years later, the three of us are still working together. After two hours, we approach the diving barge, anchored four points over the wreck. German diver, Waldemar Eiling, another veteran of Cape Caledonia, has spent the night guarding the barge with Boston University undergraduate David Owen, old Hasip Amja, and another member of a Turkish crew. As we transfer necessities onto the barge, French mechanic Jean Naz cranks the tank compressors into action, starts the airlift compressor, and stacks air-filled tanks ready for use by the morning's dives. George discusses photographs and underwater drawings made the day before, especially with architect Bill Wiener, who is responsible for the final site plan. 
but everyone on the team is involved in discussions of how to improve our efficiency. Thank you.